Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and it is time, once again, for a product review. This time I'm taking a look at Cepheus Deluxe, a science fiction role-playing game which the publisher was kind enough to provide me a review copy of. Some of you may be wondering, but Crawler, didn't you already cover Cepheus Deluxe? Well, I did. I covered it when it looked like this. However, this is the enhanced edition. It is a revision that includes mostly new artwork as well as some new layout, organizational changes, as well as a few rules tweaks. As such, this review will concentrate on the differences between this and the original version, and I will encourage people who want a more in-depth review of the basic system and my thoughts on it to watch my review of the prior version, although, having said this after I've written the entire review, this one's going to cover it in a fair amount of detail as well, so don't worry about it. Before I get too far into this review, I'd like to take a moment to thank my channel sponsor, World Anvil. World Anvil is a set of world building tools for gamers and authors, featuring templates for articles on characters, locations, and legends, the ability to make interactive maps and timelines with a chronicle system, organizational charts, and even random tables. It comes out of the box with support for over 45 role playing systems, with homebrew support and more to make it easy to organize, track, and share lore between players and GMs. And all of the same techniques used to flesh out a world for gaming can be used by authors and other creatives who can build out their plots and story events and even monetize their world by offering exclusive access to sections of the lore, articles, and the stories that they write. World Anvil has a few pricing tiers suited for different needs, and right now you can get 40% off of any yearly subscription by using the coupon code RPGCRAWLER when you sign up with my link. And with that, let's take a look at Cepheus Deluxe Enhanced Edition. Available in PDF in both hard and soft cover print, this version of Cepheus Deluxe has both full color covers and a full color interior. Much like the prior edition, the interior is laid out in a two column format with inline tables and artwork, with tables occasionally going full width where necessary. However, the text formatting is notably a bit clearer in this enhanced edition, with individual headings standing out a bit more and inline tables being a bit neater in general. In addition, the interior artwork, where it appears, is a little bit more cohesive in its styling. Largely full color, it, the art style is a bit more even throughout the book, although it has been evened out to a slightly more comic slash cartoony style. I personally think that it suits this particular book, and it makes it look a little bit more polished, but I can see how some people might have mixed opinions and prefer the older uh, line art. In terms of content, Although the rules and content are much the same, it has been reorganized in part, and the table of contents is more detailed, allowing for easier navigation throughout the book. There's an introduction, a section on the basic rules, character generation, which incorporates the skills chapter from the original version, traits, which offers a variety of modifications a character can take, equipment includes the various gear and non-combat material, while robots have been broken off into their own chapter this time. There's some sample robots, and then the vehicle covers everything from ground, air, and watercraft-style vehicles. A weapons chapter is self-explanatory, while hazards covers the various environmental hazards. Personal and vehicle combat rules follow, and then psionics has its own chapter. Starship operations is then gone into, after which trade and smuggling is touched on, then ship design chapters have their place. Ship combat rules have their own chapter outside of the vehicle combat rules, and a list of common spacecraft designs is given. World Generation Rules has its own chapter, followed by Social Counters, then Xenofauna Encounters. A brief chapter of sample NPCs is included as well. The last two main chapters are General Referee Advice, and then a list of six adventure seeds along with their details. The appendices are much the same as they were in the original, with Appendix A giving details on source of inspiration, Appendix B covers the Universal World Profile Code, Appendix C deals with the cheating death through a few different means, and Appendix D covers alien species. Appendix E covers the legal information and how to publish system material for it. And then there is Appendix F now, though, which includes various schematics for various spaceships. The book finishes out with an index and open gaming license, which, at least in the version I have, was re it was released under. Now, I'll cover what I can in more detail, but again, I'm going to try and get through this a little bit quicker than usual, since this is, again, mostly a revision of something I've already reviewed. After the table of contents, we dive right into the introduction, which gives a quick overview of RPGs in general and the Cepheus Deluxe as a classic sci-fi RPG. This is a helpful sidebar that uh, details the differences between the Cepheus Deluxe Edition and the Cepheus Lite, available separately, a more stripped-down product, 
one which I have also reviewed in the past. These include things from better compatibility with the CPS Engine SRD and core rules, less random character generation, cybernetics, changes to wounds and death, trade and starship rule changes, and much more. The introductory chapter touches on Rule Zero, giving the referee the final say in game-related questions, general system usability, and then concludes with a quick blurb on the author's Stellagama publishing itself and the Terra Arisen campaign setting, available separately, which I also reviewed. The basic rules start with a brief explanation of the dice conventions and the basic game mechanic, which is retained from the original version, a 2d6 die throw versus a target number, this time you include your skill level. There is a table of target common, uh, common target numbers, consideration for opposed throws, unskilled characters, retries, as well as working with others. The basic rules conclude with some mention of an advantage system, which allows for an extra d6, choosing the highest two of the three rolls per result, as well as an optional hero point system. The character generation section opens with a brief explanation of skills, along with some notes on changes to skills from the core SRD. There's a brief note on handling zero-level skills and uh, a uh, skill list with the names and brief examples of each skill in CPS Lux. There's a mention of how to handle various languages, and then a section on advancing skills to the use of experience points with a listing, uh, with a listing of the costs in a table. Uh, similar rules are given for languages and traits through experience over time, as well as some optional rules that allow one to improve basic characteristics. This is all given before actual character creation rules, which is a curious choice, but one which I guess works. Character creation itself starts with the first step of assigning an array of pre-generated characteristics to strength, dexterity, endurance, intelligence, education, and social standing, with each characteristic briefly described. There's an optional point by system, as well as a table of dice modifiers given to throws based on the value of the associated characteristic, as well as rules for characteristic throws, tests based not on any skill, but just the raw value of the attributes in question. Step 2 offers a choice of initial skills based on the type of homeworld a character is from, while Step 3 has characters selecting a career. There is a basic skill package given based on the overall campaign type, with different genres offering different selections, but then there's guidelines on progressing a character through a particular career turn by turn. Characters may progress through their initial career for some time before entering the game. There's some zero-level skills depending on whether a character is a military or a civilian type, a master character generation table that summarizes the various skills, aging effects, traits, benefits, roles based on the number of terms, as well as a sidebar that gives optional rules for switching careers in the way. Each career is then described in a series of tables with skills available, titles, and resources, as well as mustering out benefits based on rank, and an aging table which offers the option of various events that go on as the character stays within the career. Careers include Agent, Army, Belter, Colonist, Elite, Marine, Merchant, Navy, Pirates, Rogues, Scholars, and the Scout. After the career tables, there is a general lifetime events table used in conjunction with the aging tables. A series of rules then governs what happens when a character musters out, which basically gives ways to determine various benefits and resources, including retirement pay as needed. Aging rules follow, along with prison and injury rules, in case various life events and aging tables put the character in such positions, each of which can result in a role in its own table, which starts the character off with certain penalties. There's general costs to uh, receive corrective cybernetics and repairing injuries, which can be useful beyond character creation, just if your character gets wounded or injured in the course of a game. Step 4 of character creation has you figuring out your character's stamina and lifeblood based on your characteristics and skills, essentially their hit points and their survivability, and then stage 5 just has you wrapping up the character with cosmetic decisions and background. There's some optional rules on skill limits for new characters, and then some in-depth examples on character creation, which is incredibly useful and something which Stelgama Publishing uh, has a really good time of, is just including very in-depth examples to be to show you how things are done. The traits chapter lists a number of traits. Characters start with one, although may, be, may purchase more each uh, as they progress. Uh, each trait has a prerequisite, especially the skill-related ones, and gives a brief description of what it does, usually either offering some sort of special situational ability or skill bonus. There are a decent number of these, ranging from skill-based ones to various combat-based ones. Uh, you've got vehicle and related traits and more. Uh, it just gives you a a kind of uh, nice way to flesh your character out. Uh, now, the equipment section has been reworked a little in this particular uh, version. It gathers some things that had been in their separate headings before into one chapter. In the current version, it starts by addressing encumbrance, which is abstracted into a number of items based on your strength level. 
Tech levels are then described with a table giving examples of what is available at each level. Living expenses are addressed based on the character's social characteristic. However, at least in the version of the book I got, that section actually references a table that I can't seem to find. I don't know if it's not present, it got edited out, or what. Uh, maybe I'm just blind and it's somewhere I just can't see it. Personal armor is listed along with the table that gives armor ratings, tech levels available, costs, uh, encumbrance, and any skills are required to use it. They are elaborated on with, uh, within the text with a little description of each as you go. Uh, the basics of armor rating are given here as well, basically serving as mitigation in the system rather than avoidance. Cybernetics have been moved into the equipment section and are covered next, along with rules on the grades of cybernetics and a limit on how many a character can actually have measured by cybernetic points. They are described with their effects and briefly covered in a table, just like the armor and weapons. A table showing the cost of various personal gear is tucked in amongst the cybernetics descriptions, although a fuller list and descriptions of what each piece of gear does, along with any special rules for those pieces, follows. There are pharmaceuticals that are briefly touched upon uh, and listed as well. Just your basics. Uh, it goes into a robot section next, which covers the robot design rules. You basically select uh, parts from a robot from a series of tables, which list costs and stats that each system and type contributes to the overall robot design. There are a series of sample robots statted out as well, along with what components went into making them, so you can use that as a guideline. The vehicle section comes up shortly thereafter with an explanation of the stat blocks to follow, some rules, and a table on converting between the SRD and deluxe ways of handling certain vehicle aspects. Before, the next few pages cover numerous examples of vehicles, statted out and set up into their own blocks. This covers everything from ground craft to water and aircraft. From a variety of tech levels, spacecraft, however, are covered later in their own section. The weapons section starts with an explanation of the stats of each weapon, followed by the aspects individual weapons can have, including any area of effects, two-handed requirements, whether they are throwable, uh, modes of fire, and so forth. Weapons are then described along with the tech level required for them. This starts with melee and common range, small arms, heavy weapons, explosives, and full gunnery weapons slash vehicle weapons. Tables describing the damage, cost, ranges, ammo requirements, and various aspects are nested in amongst all of the descriptions. Finally, moving on from things that the character can buy or use, there is a section on hazards that covers things like diseases and poisons, fatigue, extreme temperatures, Fire, falling damage, radiation, starvation, suffocation, even vacuum exposure with rules and charts where necessary. Sorry. Personally and vehicle combats are next, barring spacecraft just yet. The combat procedure hasn't changed much in the enhanced edition. There is a check for surprise. Initiative is then determined by a tactics throw. And then in initiative order, each character can take two actions for attacks, movement, and so forth. I'll repeat until the end and then figure out what happened to the wounded thereafter. There's more in-depth detail on these rules, including an optional sidebar for simultaneous combat if the initiative system seems a little bit too static. There's a short menu of various actions that are common in combat. Melee attacks are basically a throw for melee combat, while ranged attack is uh, split up by weapon type. Modifiers are given for positioning and things like cover, as well as options for taking an aim shot and dealing with automatic weapons fire. Rules for throwing weapons and grenades are given uh, as a sidebar gives rules for dodging and parrying. You've got uh, that that rule set's really kind of more appropriate for melee and thrown weapons rather than full on firearms. Grappling rules are given, and then damage can be mitigated by armor, although there is an optional rule to treat armor as avoidance rather than mitigation if you prefer that. High amounts of damage can knock a character down potentially, this hasn't changed, and damage goes to stamina first, and then takes off chips of light blood. Uh, light stamina is easily recovered, while life blood represents a longer lasting and more serious wound set. Suffering a minor or serious wound can penalize a character's checks. Morale rules are given, which generally applies to NPCs, whether enemies or allies. There is an optional rule for treating certain enemies as grunts, allowing them to be taken down more readily. Various rules for healing and medical, medical care to treat wounds follow, including full-on trauma surgery for critically wounded characters. Then there's a couple of pages that walk through some detailed personal combat examples thereafter. The vehicle portion of the combat rules then starts with basics on vehicular movement and chase rules, with the chase essentially ranking vehicles in position during a round, which can affect who they can attack and then modify their ability to attack. Aerial dogfighting and even foot chases are given as variants to this rule, along with potential vehicle maneuvers to modify a chase. Collisions between vehicles are covered just before the attack rules, which suits since both can cause damage. Rather than tracing hits of damage for a vehicle directly, like in hit point, uh methodology, it's abstracted into just penetrating a vehicle's armor and then seeing what sorts of internal systems damage or uh, what kind of damage can result to the crew. A section on uh, 
a section which receives damage or internal damage then describes what happens on the section uh, depending on what is actually hit. So that's good. Uh, rules for repairing vehicles and then using ordinary vehicle weapons against starships and vice versa follow. Before the section concludes with a set of vehicular combat examples, just like all the others. The psionics chapter starts with the basic rules on determining a character's psionic strength, as well as rules on using talents. Each of five psionic talents is listed then awareness, clairvoyance, telekinesis, telepathy, and teleportation. Each one with a specific set of powers given and their psi costs and effects. There's also a few pieces of specifically psionic equipment available. And, wow, I say sonic too many times in this particular section. The uh, Starship section of the rules starts with a chapter on Starship operations. Important, of course, for a sci-fi rule set. Couldn't get very far without a Starship. There's a basic description on uh, the time involved for interplanetary travel as based on the individual ship's thrust rating, then interstellar travel is covered with a procedure for using a jump drive outline, along with the suitable difficulty modifiers for various uh, destinations. The starship expenses are then gone into in some detail, since running a starship is expensive business, uh, including the starship's mortgage, the salary of various crew members, fueling and life support costs, port fees, and maintenance. There's also a number of options for, give, for uh, gaining revenue given, uh, with rules and guidelines for passage between destinations, which can be used either from the point of view of the passenger or the cargo owner, if, or the ship owner, if you want to use it for uh, just booking passage without a ship. There's pay values for bulk freight and mail, rules for accepting chartered cargo. Uh, rules for using various sorts of detectors and sensors are given right before the details on starship encounters are gone over. They are organized by type of system or region they take place in, and then there are procedures for generating a ship, detecting it, and what that ship's reaction may be. Trading and smuggling rules start with a procedure for speculative trading, obtaining the supplies, pricing, and the like. There are some guidelines for smuggling, notably avoiding law enforcement, and then determining the price of what you're going to sell, both purchasing and, well, or you can buy them at that price. Notably, much of the prior encounter tables are scattered here as well, just kind of tucked into this particular section. There's some guidelines on what things, uh, what kinds of things might go wrong with a deal, and then there's some examples of using these trade rules mixed with the various trade goods, pricing, and uh, traffic and legality modifiers. <sighs> the uh, chapter on ship design offers a way to customize ships, either for purchase by the characters or for use as NPC ships. One basically selects from a series of tables, including the hull, its configuration, any armor, its drives, power plants, bridge, electronic and weaponry systems, other components, crew living quarters, uh, cargo space, all of which modify the cost and construction time. This section concludes with a detailed ship construction example at the very end. The uh, ship combat rules are next and function similarly to the vehicle combat rules in terms of determining position as part of the combat. However, since the entire crew is aboard one ship, the actions are divided into five positions on board a ship to give everybody a chance to do something. With the captain, pilot, sensor operator, gunner, and engineer each given different options on what they can do during any particular combat round, there may be multiple gunners in some of these positions, for, or multiple crew in some of these positions, for instance, gunners, if there are different weapons and turrets, some of which have individual stations that may allow multiple crew to contribute. After all these positions are detailed, there are a series of optional rules for streamlining various aspects of space combat. Rules for ship damage are given, uh, and although they are slightly more detailed than the vehicle damage rules, they take a similar vein, with targeted areas being subjected to different grades of damage, from surface to internal to critical, even destroyed status, each component of a ship may or may not sustain more than one hit, with different effects for each one. The section rounds up with a brief guide to repairing damage, as well as some space combat examples, as normal. The common spacecraft design section is simple enough, just offering a variety of small and system ships, as well as starships designed with their requisite tech levels, loadouts, costs, and crew requirements. This is followed by a world generation rules, offering guidelines on mapping out a sector on a hex grid, then creating worlds within it through rolling or selecting from a series of parameters, including the world size, atmosphere, hydrographics, population, government law level, any starport, tech level, various trade codes to show what type of production is there, any naval bases, what sort of travel zone applies, any collected allegiances and trade routes. Tables are scattered within the rules as needed, and there's a brief example on creating a world. Social encounters are covered next and divided into various types, from animals to legal, routine, random, even encounters with potential patrons. Social encounters are not necessarily going to lead to combat, so there's various 
tables to determine an NPC's a reaction and then details thereof from rumors to random encounters at various locations. An NPC's problems and motivations, their characteristics, how trustworthy a patron is, and how uh, or what they can offer. Types of jobs they can present with the same for business encounters as well. This is followed by a chapter on xenofauna, which includes various procedures for generating animals based on their niche ecosystem size and such, any armor or weapons they may have, their movement speed and reactions, even an example of an encounter with some xenofauna. An entire uh, section of sample NPCs with generic stat blocks follows up, uh, so one can easily populate various encounters. The chapter on referee advice serves as a catch-all for running the game and begins with building a setting, offering some guidelines on what careers might fit. <clears throat> There's some tips on engaging in high-level play, detailing various factions and groups, modifying the tech level or assumed technology, and details on using contacts and enemies, including some ideas in a table. Then uh, there is a set of adventure seeds, giving a brief framework for potential adventures. This book begins to conclude with a series of appendices. Thereafter, Appendix A functions much like the old Appendix N from AD&D, offering a set of inspirational books uh, and also other things like films, games, and so on. Appendix B details the uh, UWP from the Cepheus Core uh, Engine, the Cepheus Engine Core rules. Appendix C offers it options to avoid death, such as cyborg conversion and biorec construction. Appendix D details some very uh, generic playable aliens. I think they've got like things like the Greys and insectoids, yeah, rep reptiloids, insectoids, and Greys. Very kind of generic kind of things. Uh, Appendix E offers your legal information for publishing stuff compatible with the system. And finally, Appendix F offers a series of ship schematics. The book concludes thereafter with an index, the OGL legal, and some various character sheets. So, what do I think of CPS Deluxe Enhanced Edition? Well, there's two ways to look at it. What do I think of it as a system, and what do I think of it in comparison with the original version? So, I'm actually going to go to start with the latter, since a lot of the details that have that I have to answer in that have to do with the presentation, which is usually what I touch on first in my conclusion. I didn't really notice much in the way of really standout rule changes with the Enhanced Edition. Most of it just seems to be cleaned up rules from the prior version. And much of the writing style is as it was in the original version, clear, concise, and easy to read. Barring an omission here and there, which I already mentioned during the summary, I find that the editing and the section rearrangements to improve this version of CPS Deluxe, I like them quite a bit. Uh, the original organization was already decent, but this version shifts a few rounds, a uh, few things around to where they may be more logically found, and I can give them credit for that. The artwork is, well, it's certainly different than the original version. I find that it gives the book a more cohesive look, and while it does change the overall feel, I believe that I credit the original as having a very classic old-school style feel. Uh, I actually don't think that it does so to a huge degree. The new art, while full color, is not exactly what you'd call clean and modern, and I still, uh, I, I still say that it does maintain a very old-school feel, just a slightly different one than before. I guess the closest I might compare it to are the various printings of the old AD&D 2nd edition books. The art in the black cover books was substantially different than the original versions, and different people may have their own preferences. I think it'll be the same with this one. From a presentation point of view, however, I do prefer the way that things are laid out in this enhanced edition, although I'm not sure that it's enough to justify purchasing it if you already own the original book, unless you just love supporting the publisher, and that's perfectly fine. Lots of reasons to do that. They're good people. And this brings us to the system. And, well, I have to say that the system hasn't changed much, if at all. When I reviewed the original version, I had very limited experience with the CPS engine in general. Since then, I've had the opportunity to review more systems based on it, see other companies' variations and so forth, and, well, I stand by initial, my initial thoughts on the system way back when, generally a favorable with some caveats. CPS Deluxe is a fine system that distills sci-fi role-playing into an easily digestible old-school-style format. I have been told that some people don't appreciate the way that some things were simplified or left out of this version of the system, but as somebody who's looking in without the sort of exposure the system is based off of, I find these simplifications and things like skills and such to be of benefit, at least to me. It plays well, it plays quickly, and is generally compatible with a lot of things now, while offering more long-term options for gaming than the CPS Lite rule set did from the same publisher. The fact that they now have a few different settings to use this system in makes the recommendation a bit easier now. All in all, CPS Deluxe's Enhanced Edition offers what I believe to be the definitive version of the CPS Deluxe uh, system. 
It's slightly easier to navigate and has a more cohesive look. For people who are looking to, for a complete overhaul, you'll be disappointed. Indeed, if you own the original CPS Deluxe at all, you can probably give it a miss. But if you're looking to just get into the system for the first time, or if you want a table book to offer new players, or to keep for yourself while you offer the other one to your players, it's worth a look. And on that note, I'm going to wrap things up here. Wow, that summary turned out to be just as long as the previous one, despite how I tried to get through it a little bit quickly. As always, I'll put a link to where you can pick this one up below. This has been the RPG Crawler with my look at Cepheus Deluxe Enhanced Edition. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment on your feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content. Until next time, take care and goodbye. And if you are still watching, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my supporters, the top tiers of which are listed on the screen, without whose support I would not have been able to offer the variety of content that I have on this channel throughout the years. If you're feeling particularly generous and would like to join them, you can support the channel. There are a variety of options to do so. I have a Patreon, a Subscribestar, as well as channel memberships enabled. If you are not in a position to contribute, simply leaving a like, a comment, or sharing my videos are all wonderful ways to help the channel grow without spending a dime and are all greatly appreciated.